Good morning and welcome to a very special edition of uh, of Tigers and Teddies. Today we're looking at uh, connected communities and it's a raw, I, I say it every week, it's a special uh, episode, but this is a rather special episode. It's a milestone because it's our, it's our final uh, episode of the season uh, of uh, 2020 and uh, we've got some very special figures I think to share with you and we want this to be uh, a celebration as we get towards the end of our 60 minutes together but as I always say I couldn't do this certainly couldn't do this with uh, without the uh, assistance and the guidance of Dr Suzanne Zedike. Suzanne good morning to you. Gary it is lovely to see you back and especially in that Christmas bow tie. Oh yes, thank you for for reminding. There is a I've got. I did say I would wear this at the end of the season, so you can see that. Uh, can I just put this up to the screen? It's thanks to. Uh, I don't know whether that's back to front, but it's certainly back to front to me. But this is from this is from Willoughby Bear. So thank you, Willoughby, who uh, has tweeted this morning. Who is after my job by the looks of things? Have a look on Twitter. It's hilarious. <laughs> It, the, the, the Willoughby Bear has headphones and a microphone and a bow tie. I don't know what's going on. Um, but I've got to say hello to Felicity Douglas. Felicity, good morning to you, my friend. Thank you for getting Willoughby to send me uh, this wonderful bow tie, which I will be wearing on Christmas Day, um, but also to celebrate uh, your book the, that's out uh, now, I believe, which is a, an inspirational story. So thank you very much indeed. Love it. Can I just come in there? It is a really inspirational story that Felicity has written. It's a story of recovery. And so for anybody who is on a journey of recovery, and we have certainly talked about those over the, the last episodes, uh, Felicity's book is a great one to dive into. And I love that it's being uh, celebrated with all this enthusiasm like Willoughby Bear's enthusiasm and your new bow tie. Love it. I love it. I'm very proud of it. Thank you. Um, so let's move on. Before we meet our guests, Suzanne, who would have thought, and we'll look at, we'll look at what the series has brought uh, in terms of uh, building our own community, actually, uh, as we get to the end of our hour. But who'd have thought we'd be in this position? We were, th we were thinking maybe we'd just do one or two episodes and, and here we are. Um, how's, it been, how's it been for you? Because you've been the driving force behind this. So, you know, it was all about launching that wonderful book that you've got behind you. Uh, and now here we are almost six months more uh, down the line. And I'm hoping that we work together again uh, next year. How's it been for you? Well, if everyone remembers in May, we launched this book and it was only going to be a one-time event. We had to figure out how to do an online launch and people seem to love that so much that it just grew into this whole series, which has now had 12 episodes and we have explored so many different topics, Gary, and I am delighted that we are ending on a community topic and a community who has thrived during COVID. And for me, that is a really positive story that I think we need and that I think is great to carry away. And at the center of all of it is a story of Teddy's. So. Wonderful, wonderful. It's like we've rehearsed this. Oh, we've rehearsed it, isn't it? Yeah, okay. uh, so let's move, <laughs> let's move on to uh, our guests. Uh, hello, uh, Julia Morton. Hello, Julia, good morning to you. Oh, good morning, Gary and Suzanne and everyone else. Thank you so much for being here and listening to what we have to share today. We're very excited about this. Uh, you have a wonderful story uh, to share. Tell me a little bit about those flying. I've, I've got teddies, right? And I'm quite envious. What's going on there? Flying teddies. Well, as you will hear, we have a thriving teddy population in Stonehaven. So this is my newest squad here. I think I'm going to name this one Alice and you'll find out why shortly. Um, and they wanted to be all on screen and I couldn't find out how to make it work. So they, they whispered in my ear that they wanted to fly. I love that so much. Julia, I'll come back to you in just a second. Thank you ever so much. Uh, and our other guests this morning uh, are a mother and daughter duo. I'm delighted to say hello. I'm going I'm to use your Sunday name first, Jennifer. So Jennifer, hello. Good morning. Good morning, Gary. You're Jen from here on in. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and the wonderful Alice. Hello, Alice. Good morning. Hi. Hiya. Oh, you're so cool. Tell me, about, Alice, tell me about that teddy you've got there. My, my mum gave me it um, when my granny and grandpa came to stay. 
wonderful and i can see how hard you do you give do you give your teddy big hugs like that yeah i can see and and does teddy have a name teddy <laughs> Teddy, His name is Teddy. Teddy. Quite right too. Makes Teddy the Teddy. Teddy the Teddy. I love it. Uh, and, the, and, and, and Jen, you were holding up a, a, a Teddy there. Tell me about yours. Yeah, my Teddy is quite old. My big sister knitted this Teddy for me um, for my first birthday. Um, I think she was in primary three at the time. And uh, so he's a bit, he's, he's quite long. <laughs> <laughs> Little he's, bit, gone. he's gone a little bit floppy, yeah. um, but he's I've, he's my special teddy. I've also got I've also got a very big teddy. Oh, who's showing off now? Yeah, Where, where's there. where's before we go before we go to Julia? Where's your big teddy? Is he there? Yeah, I've got two ones. One's very long and one's very tall. Right. Well, tell you what, we'll come. We'll come and have a look at your teddies in just a minute, Alice. Uh, we'll come right back to you because I know that you're you're bursting to tell me the story, and we'll certainly come back to you. So, Alice and Jen, great to have you on board. Thank you for joining us this morning. Really appreciate it. Um, Julia, if I could come back to you, um, I didn't start to do the research on your story until this morning uh, because you know I, bits of information were filtering through to me and I just wanted to absorb it all as opposed to taking it in all piecemeal and the more that I read about your story the more I was getting excited about it and I don't want to give too much away I always almost want to keep it a, a little bit like a suspense thriller uh, if you know where I'm going with this so so first of all you're involved in a wonderful project and there's two projects we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, we'll talk about The Haven uh, in just a moment or two. But first of all, tell me about the community larder that sits within The Haven. So this is all happening in Stonehaven, but tell me about the community larder. What is it and what does it do? Mm -hmm. So the community larder was um, born out of The Haven's ability to deeply listen to community needs. And um, we'll talk a bit earlier I guess about what we were prior to the pandemic but essentially we're a community well-being space and it was sitting empty and our doors were closed and all the doors were closed in our community and I was like what can we do to open the doors and be there for our community and just had the great fortune of knowing that food insecurity and food poverty was already an escalating issue um, in our area because it's predominantly reliant on oil and gas. And um, we are actually tracked to have the highest levels of unemployment in Scotland, um, which has been compounded by the pandemic. And that's how the community larder was born. Tell me a little bit about Stonehaven for people who don't know uh, uh, I mean, people have definitely heard of Stonehaven, I imagine, but where it is, it's on the east coast of Scotland. Tell me about it as a, as a community. Before we, indeed, before we had COVID, and then, of course, uh, prior to that, the downturn with oil and gas, was it a, was it a, a thriving community? Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, if you haven't been to Stonehaven, you should definitely come, and you're all welcome to come to see the Haven too. Um, it is predominantly a middle-class area, and therefore, um, it doesn't have trauma and it doesn't have poverty. And that is the perception in Stonehaven. And it's really interesting because I've worked and lived in um, areas that are considered to be more socially deprived. And what I found is, is actually there's a lot more solidarity there. There's a lot more training. There's a lot more funding and more resources. Um, and I was always of the opinion if um, a community like Stonehaven, as affluent as Stonehaven can't get it right in terms of, of, of supporting vulnerable people, then what's, you know, what's the hope for the rest of us? So, so, so the community larder uh, is, and people can check you out on, uh, on, on your website and we'll promote that uh, in a wee while, but the community larder is, is essentially anybody can go to it and they can donate food, but they can also take food. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So we already had two uh, food banks operating in Stonehaven. So I knew that that model was being well and truly um, catered for. However, a community food lighter is a really different model. And the main point is, is a food bank is more of a crisis response. So you need to be referred and you also receive three days worth of food, which just is delivered at your door with not much human interaction, especially during the pandemic. 
um, a community food lighter model is open to everyone. There's, there's no referral, there's no questions, you don't need to give any details to be able to, to engage with the lighter. So what we were finding in the beginning, it was actually a lot of shielding box products. So the government was sending people food and maybe this wasn't always to their requirements, but they didn't want to seem to be ungrateful, but they didn't know where to put the food. And so it was a way of us um, kind of reducing food waste in our community. And I think the best part about the community food lighter is that um, with our food waste angle as well, because we found out that there was food being thrown away in our community every day, um, and now we collect all that food, is that by engaging with people who are really interested in reducing food waste, and they're engaging with the lighter from that point of view, it's reducing the stigma around people who we call like the newly hungry. So it means people who never thought they'd be in this position. They never, um, envisioned or imagined that they would have to engage with food poverty and food insecurity before and we just make it as comfortable as possible so to reduce the anxiety so that they can be brave enough to cross the threshold. Suzanne I'll come to you in just a second if I may but Julie I just want to follow up on that tell me a little bit about the environment of uh, of the community larder so you, you know when you walk in you know, what, what are we faced with? What, what does it look like? How does it feel? Mm -hmm. So we really try our hardest to make it feel exactly like a shop. And actually, when we first opened, quite a few people came in and tried to pay us <laughs> as they were leaving. <laughs> Um, and we have, uh, we're very kid friendly because the Haven's Aims has always been, um, early intervention and prevention. And to, to take that from a mental health and well-being standpoint, that means you need to engage with pregnancy, babies and young people. And what we were hearing in our community was a lot of distress from mothers who had taken their children into um, supermarkets and that had been a really traumatic experience for them because there's a lot of fear around the pandemic and children might not understand social distancing um, and perhaps adults not being as kind and understanding from a child's point of view. So we were very quick at the lighter to make it um, as positive an experience as possible. So we provided little kids shopping trolleys and we had baskets and every kid uh, could come in and receive a teddy. And the, and the teddies were knitted by the community, is that right? Yes. So one of the things we do in our spare time at the Haven is we really believe in advocacy um, and advice, adverse childhood experiences. And we set up Stonehaven Trauma Informed Communities, which is our advocacy arm. And uh, through that, through our work through um, ACES, we, we heard about the teddies and nobody wants me to knit a teddy, <laughs> Gary. <laughs> I have many talents. Knitting is not one of them, but a really fortunate. There's an amazing cafe in Stonehaven called The Villa. And not only do they make fine pieces, but there is a lot of elderly in our community. Um, and Jeannie and her family do a wonderful job of upholding them. And Jeannie really is the warrior S behind the knitting community because I'm not originally from Stonehaven. I'm that weird foreigner. And, uh, but Jeannie's got all the connections and, and networks and she's got a knitting troupe of amazing women, um, keeping us in a, in a thriving teddy population. So Julia, Julia, tell them how many teddies have been knitted over the time that the Haven's been set up. Oh, I mean, honestly, sometimes I'm, I think, a silver lining of the pandemic is that we were able to rehome all the teddies because my garage was full of teddies. <laughs> we have had thousands of teddies knitted. So all, yes. the, all the teddies behind Julia's head have been knitted by local knitters. And that means that those teddies are available to give out to whatever children need them and want them. So that's why Alice, who we're going to come back to in just a moment, one of Al, that, the teddy that we first met from Alice named Teddy, was, was knitted by a local member. And in fact, Alice sent us a picture of Teddy in our very first broadcast in the launch. So this is kind of like going full circle. Alice had done a picture of Teddy. So it's a, the story we have just heard is incredibly inclusive. And so it's bringing together the elderly, babies, all the ages in between. 
And if I go all the way back to something that Julia, that you said at the very beginning, you, you said a bit tongue in cheek, people think you know, that middle class areas don't have trauma and don't have deprivation. And one of the risks that we run in Scotland when we think about trauma in deprived communities is that we make it about communities and people over there and those communities over there. And so one of the reasons that I'm excited about the Haven story is that it reminds us that this is about all of us. There are lots of new people who have encountered food poverty for the very first time during the pandemic. And that, I think, that awareness helps us to think about lots of things that people won't really have been aware that is happening for other people. And that's why I love this morning. Julia, one thing that I, I noticed, um, and I love it in terms of communication, the words that are used, because I think words are very important and very impactful with this. I see words like safe, dignity. I hear those words being mentioned on your video, on, uh, on, on your website. Certainly, there's a, a, an example of how there's a real cross-generation use of uh, of the community larder and and you said something to me pre-interview pre-going live and you talked about social capital I mm -hmm. love that phrase tell me a little mm -hmm. bit more about what you mean mm -hmm. so this is specifically um, linked to our crowdfunder um, which was has is still going it's going to the 28th of November and we needed to do it because um, we funding is inconsistent and it's restrictive and we were in a serious situation where we were going to have to close the doors of the larder and the crowdfunder was our journey to understand although we didn't have capital in a monetary sense what we've learned is that we have social capital and there's a fancy word for social capital, like a fancy definition, but my understanding of it is social capital is all the things that money can't buy. It's about engagement. It's about enthusiasm. It's loyalty. It's trust in your organization. It's people understanding and believing in what you're doing and willing to invest in that, whether it's five pounds and even the people who didn't um, put money into the crowdfunder, but supported us by showing up at the larder, even though they didn't need to engage with us from a food poverty and food insecurity perspective. Because by them crossing the threshold, it was reducing stigma and getting other people to cross into the larder. Um, and that's the part that is priceless, is all the things that money can't buy. And that's what we have oodles of at the Haven, is that we have just built so much social capital that we're the wealthiest grassroots organization, I'd say, in Scotland. I, uh, we're getting lots of lovely messages about your enthusiasm and your wonderful smile, <laughs> Julia, uh, I have to say, and I completely agree. Uh, Jen, if I could come to you now and come to uh, Alice. Um, Alice, you were proud. I saw you on camera there when uh, Suzanne was talking about your picture and the picture's behind you. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. Oh, it is, Alice, I have missed that. It's such a fabulous picture of Teddy. It's why I'm glad we've got to meet him for real. So we've, we've learned um, uh, in the first well, sort of 20 minutes of, of the broadcast uh, about, um, uh, about the, 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 the part of the project called Community Larder, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But Jen, I'm really keen to find out what your engagement w is or has been with, with the Haven and possibly, you know, the, the community larder. So, you know, tell me a little bit about, about your involvement and how you and Alice came to become involved. My first um, experience of being in the Haven was not long after it had opened and Julia hosted a screening of the Resilience documentary. And one of my friends and I were very, very interested and went along to watch it and I was absolutely blown away. It's something that, although I've worked in really deprived areas, it was sort of reframing my thoughts and it made me look at things differently and think about how we respond to people and there's people who are living with toxic stress and so on, and about 
working with children and making sure that they um, have secure connections as they're growing up. So that was my first experience of the Haven and it was just a lovely, it was a lovely place to be. It was something quite new in Stonehaven and I felt that over the, the last few years as it's been there it's brought together lots of different opportunities and different therapies and made things really accessible which weren't necessarily accessible before or, or you had to really really search if you wanted to go and find some yoga or alternative therapies this has really brought everything together and maybe made it a little bit more mainstream if you like I've always been interested in alternative therapies but this has made it really accessible for everybody. Um, it, so I've attended yoga classes there. It's really interesting having now been in the larder to see what a fantastic use of the space because it really does feel more like a shop, but having been in it as a yoga studio as well, I can see how cleverly everything's been laid out and just what a fantastic way of transforming a space and making it really useful. Um, in this current situation. I've attended the various different um, wellbeing events and the wellbeing festivals that um, Julia has organised before and then this year when I realised that Suzanne was going to be coming to speak I had to go because I'm such a big fan and that was absolutely amazing. It was a really interesting talk, really interesting things that I took away from it, things that I suppose when Alice was a little, when she was a baby, things that I didn't know. And I suppose there were some times when that was, it was quite difficult, some of the things that I was listening to. But I remember one of the things that Suzanne said is, you only know what you know when you know it. So moving on from that, thinking, well, now I know what I need to do to make sure that Alice can grow up to be the best she can be. And then as I was leaving that day, they had a box of teddy bears. And he did remind me of my teddy, although they don't necessarily look like each other. Um, it did remind me of my teddy bear. So I thought I wanted to, to get one for Alice. And actually we left there and went to the villa for our lunch with my mum and dad. And there was lots of teddies there. And we had to make sure that Alice was saying, I did buy this one. <laughs> this is my own one. <laughs> I've not just taken one from the display. <laughs> so so can, can I see the Haven, Haven teddy? Is the Haven teddy there? So that's that's the original teddy that, that that you're talking about, is that right? Yeah, and Wonderful. this is the teddy. And Gary, one of the reasons that that day that Jen has just described is really important is that that was my last event at the Haven Wellbeing Festival. That was the third Wellbeing Festival. That was the last event I did before lockdown. So everything happened the week after that. So that's my last live event. And to just keep giving flavors, where I gave my talk that day was in the, the central community uh, space that, that felt very, very formal. And yet it was covered in teddy bears all over. So there was something, it almost felt like a law court, almost. And yet when you when you bring together this understanding of trauma, which the teddies represented, you had a real sense of how a community could be transformed through people's enthusiasm and curiosity, which is exactly what Jen has been describing, and which Alice is now helping us to see, even by the way that she is doing teddy across that screen. And and Jen and Alice, it was also uh, a last for you in a way, wasn't it? Because it was Jen the la the last time in the in the in what was normal then that it was the last time you saw mom and dad although you've you've seen them previously or gran and granddad forgive me in terms of the relationship and that was the same for um uh for alice as well wasn't it so it wasn't just uh, uh suzanne's last gig before everything went into lockdown it was sort of the weekend that the, the world changed it was and i think i've looked back on that time quite often and thinking I didn't fully appreciate when I was saying goodbye to them and I was giving them a big kiss and a cuddle. I didn't have any concept that, you know, would be in towards the end of November and I hadn't been able to, I have not been able to give them a kiss and a cuddle since then. Um, Alice has, because obviously things are a little bit different for, for children. Um, but, you know, I've had to stand 
a distance away and do virtual hugs and things like that. Um, so that day, yeah, they were they were here that day as well. So if we can come to Alice now, Alice, um, obviously that's that's uh, Haven Teddy, which is fantastic. Um, can you can you show me the rest of the guys? Because I believe yeah. that's the collective name for your teddies. Uh, so who who have we got? Introduce introduce us to them and tell me tell us why you love them so much. Who's that? Monkey. Monkey. Tell me about Monkey. Um. He, well, he was actually the first ever teddy that I've actually had. The first ever toy. Mum got it to me when I, when I was when yeah when she was pregnant and and he was the one who actually founded the guys. Oh, wonderful! And who else have we got? You've got some wonderful teddies there. Who's the Who's the pink teddy? Oh, this is Pink Monkey. Pink Monkey, excuse me, Pink Monkey. Yeah. And then there's Eddie Monkey. Eddie Monkey, lovely. And tell me about Eddie. Eddie Monkey looks looks cool. Is Eddie Monkey pretty cool? Is he? Yeah. He looks um, great. Eddie, Eddie Monkey. Um, was a, uh, is a special monkey because um, Alice's uncle Eddie was um, quite unwell for, uh, he still is um, unwell um, and has been for quite a long time. So he was named after Uncle Eddie. And Eddie Monkey has a voice box in his hand. Oh, can we hear? <laughs> we got that. It's a, a laugh, a laugh, laughing Eddie. I love it. Yeah. And this one's. Banana monkey. That He's is got a bow tie on too. Oh my goodness. There we go. Yeah, I made that out of some cords on a, one of my hair clips. And this one? And this is Bunny. I'm loving and Bunny. Yeah, we made the dress yesterday. And this is Nessie. Oh, Teddy's there. <laughs> Alice, can you tell me, you know, sometimes people think that all those soft toys. Can you tell people why all of the guys are important to you? Because they're they're really cuddly and sometimes when I'm sad, um go upstairs and give them a give all of them a big cuddle. And can you tell people this is a hard question, Alice? what you think it would feel like if you didn't have the guys to help you when you were sad what would that be like? yeah i'd feel a bit lonely i'd feel a bit lonely here's the thing alice here's why it's really powerful that you're here this morning sometimes grown-ups don't understand how important teddies and monkeys are and so when you tell us that you would feel lonely without them it helps us to actually think about how you feel connected in your body. That is why I so wanted to have you here this morning, because you help grown-ups to get it. And we need to tell all the grown-ups in the country how important feeling connected and help with sadness is. So I'm just delighted that you're here to help us all know that. <laughs> Julia, uh, I can see there's a mixture of emotions happening for you um, at the moment. Um, what, what are you thinking? How, how are you, what are you thinking when you hear, and how are you feeling when you hear Alice talk about her connection to her teddies and monkeys in that way? Well, I'm just really glad that Alice um, came along to today's session to share that because I think that's the whole purpose of it. Um, and it's just really refreshing and encouraging to be in a space where you're with people who get it because so much of my time is trying to explain exactly what Alice just shared to people, um, that that's something that needs to be nurtured and funded and supported and valued. And I just think about, you know, when I'm walking around Stonehaven and I see all the Haven teddies in the buggies, and in the toddler's hands and i think we're just changing a community one teddy at a time i love that 
changing communities one teddy at a time. Let's come back to that in just a second. Uh, Jen, Alice, I'm going to come to you because not only do you cuddle uh, your teddies and your monkeys, but you've got a very special cushion there. Tell me about it. Uh, my granny and my grandpa in it, and I got it. My mum got it for me when I was really missing my granny and grandpa in lockdown. Like, I couldn't see them at all, and the only way that we would be able, that we could talk to each other was on the phone, and I just missed having them here, like, personally. And, and what some people didn't see before we started going live on this was how, how, how tight you cuddled that cushion. <coughs> yeah. Wonderful. And, and Julia, I think you've been inspired by, by the cushion story as well. Oh, totally. Alice has just sorted out my Christmas list now because I was like, what do we get the grandparents who have everything? <laughs> so now we're going to make a grandchildren version of, of the cushion and, and send that to them. So thank you, Alice, for being my little Santa elf. So can we a bit of science in now, Gary? Here's some cushion science. <laughs> what Alice has just shown us in what she calls her granny and granddad pillow Science would call it a transitional object. Okay, transitional objects are very often the teddies that we hang on to and that we're used to having children needing, and it helps them to calm down and they get really distressed if they lose them as babies. So sometimes you see on Twitter a really distressed parent because their child has lost a, a soft toy when they were out in the buggy and their child has cried for three days and hasn't stopped crying. That soft toy literally is part of their self-regulation. It literally has a biological impact. And so the scientists came up with this fancy name called transitional objects. And sometimes we think that those pass when you get past babyhood. But Alice, what you have just shown us is really a transitional object. It helps to connect in a very physical way, Alice with her grandparents. When she can't cuddle them literally, she can cuddle the representation of them. And so that physical, sensory experience of her grandparents helps bridge the loneliness. And so if more people knew that, maybe there will be suddenly a run on photo pillows if other people take that idea away here. Because I think it matters not just for the grandchildren, but as you have said, for the grandparents as well, Julia. What we're trying to do in this time is figure out how can we stay more connected, and that matters to all of us biologically. And I love the idea that it's seven-year-old Alice with her granny and granddad pillow that has helped us to better understand that. Thank you, Alice, for that. Mm -hmm. Suzanne, can I say as well that, um, because Alice loved her monkey so much, um, I know my best friend's watching this today, and when she had her first baby, we bought him a toy monkey, just a, a, small, a, a smaller one, a slightly different one from Alice's one. And a few months back, well, before lockdown, they were out one day and he did lose his, and he lost it in Ikea, and they hadn't managed to find it. So I knew, I knew how Alice would be if her monkey had disappeared. So I very quickly went online and bought another one and got it delivered to their house. So within a few days, he had, he had a monkey back again. Gary, that's a connected community. That's the kind of bubble that you need around you to help raise children. People who can help to anticipate where the distress and the hard times will come from for the children and the adults and step in to support. Very often our culture doesn't understand that. What we see is behavior rather than the emotions underneath. And so the, the stories that we are sharing today are about how a community can be connected. And through, throughout, you know, throughout our whole, all our broadcasts, We've looked at lots of different topics, but we haven't had a chance to use this word community in quite the same way. And I love the idea that in this last broadcast, we're rippling out 
and you can see teddies on the street, as Julia just said. Uh, I'm going to come back to Julia in just a moment. Just a reminder that if you want to join in the chat, uh, please do and make sure that you're using uh, all panelists and attendees. Uh, there's lots of comments coming in uh, this morning. Remember, hashtag Tigers and Teddies. Please join the conversation. This is your last opportunity to do so uh, for uh, 2020. But I've got a sneaking suspicion we will be back uh, early next year. But more of that in just a moment or two. Um, Julia, let's talk about that community and let's take that a little bit further. I love that phrase, connected community. It's a, it's, it's wonderful. Um, and let's talk about the Haven now. So, tell me, how how do you how do you believe that the Haven, being there since 2017, how has it changed lives in Stonehaven? Do you think? I think the best way to um, demonstrate the impact that the Haven has had is through our volunteers, which are the Haven helpers. So, so very quickly, I was getting approached by people who had benefited from the Haven saying, Haven's helped me so much, how can I give back? And me not really knowing how to harness that potential, um, because my, my previous experience with volunteers was that they all end up bitter and resentful, and I never wanted anyone at the Haven to feel like that. Um, and then it was actually during the Haven Wellbeing Festival that um, we invited Suzanne to that we launched our Haven Helper Volunteer Program. And I think it's because of that um, engagement and, and impact we've had that people we've supported now want to support other people. And the Haven Community Larder could not have existed had we not had that army of uh, Haven helpers in, you know, waiting in the ranks just to help their community when the community needed help the most. I, I used the, the phrase earlier and it, it was obviously a significant part of, of, uh, of, of earlier this year with Suzanne's um, uh, last gig, uh, obviously, when when Jen and Alice saw Grand and Grandad, really for the last time, effectively, when the world changed that weekend, when the world changed, what changed for you, Jen? Uh, sorry, Julia, what changed for you? Um, I think what I would just like to acknowledge is how beautiful the synergy and the cyclical nature of this is that Jen, Suzanne and I, the last time we were in a room together was at that moment. Um, and the Haven Wellbeing Festival is how we raise funds for our Haven Wellbeing Fund. So that way we have money throughout the year. So if anybody who wants to engage with the Haven and our wellbeing activities or needs subsidized counseling for their children because they don't wanna wait six months on comms, um, we can provide that. And it's really important to understand that by Suzanne coming and answering our call, um, because we couldn't afford as a community to go to the ACES conference and we wanted to bring the wisdom to our community. And Suzanne did that completely free of charge. She didn't even let us pay for her train ticket. <laughs> and we raised a thousand pounds from that one event on the back of uh, Suzanne's wisdom and the teddies that we were offering for a donation. And it's because of that money that we raised during the Wellbeing Festival, we were able to then keep our doors open um, uh, for the larder. Without that money, we wouldn't have been able to do the larder. So I just really want to take this opportunity, if it's okay, Gary, because I don't want to miss out, because we're really proud as a community of how we could show our deep, heartfelt gratitude for Suzanne, not only showing up for the Wellbeing Festival, but then continuing to inspire people like myself and Jen, you know, in our communities um, to really be the leader we needed. And so uh, the Stonehaven Knitters, one in particular called Vera, um, knitted something special for Suzanne. Would it be okay if we showed it? Let's go over to Suzanne now. She's holding it with pride. And, and you're on mute, by the way, Suzanne. <laughs> you're on mute. Love it. That's the phrase of the year, isn't it? But now I'm not on mute. This is a knitted me. Look, this is a knitted me. Look, with big curly hair and even with bangles. 
when the community gave this to me on that day, I cried. Now, you know, she sits with my other treasured items, but what this for me captures creativity, right? This for me captures something of the sense of, of the energy that the Haven and that Stonehaven have been able to bring together. This is this lovely little girl is connected to insights about drama and loneliness and disconnection. And I think it is being able to do it lightly and joyfully that lets us step into the, the deeper, edgier conversations that we need to have. And so Julia, Jen, Alice, that's what this little girl has come to represent for me is that balance between joy and curiosity about edgy things. And I think you've got that in Stonehaven. Mm -hmm. Julia, what does, what does Christmas look like at the Haven? Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got news hot off the press, which we haven't even made public yet, which is that we are moving the louder uh, so we can reclaim our yoga studio back and, um, you know, reconnect with our aims of early intervention and prevention, especially for the young people and the youth in our community. And we really want to reclaim that space back for them. And we have um, a, a room at the community centre now in Stonehaven. So we'll be operating two locations. And it's just a short term solution, but it gives us access to a commercial kitchen. So then we can move into our phase three, which is turning the food waste into meals. And we have lots of really exciting, innovative ideas at how we can engage the community and support the community through that. Uh, and, and beyond Christmas, obviously, crowdfunding has been successful. It's still ongoing. Um, how long has that now given you in terms of a lifeline? So in terms of operational expenses, we were aiming for £22,000 in six months. So that covers things like rent, utilities, you know, the 50 volunteers we have to be able to support and look after the volunteers' well-being. We really need a volunteer coordinator. Um, so there's staff costs in that. And there's no funding for staff costs. And I can genuinely say... Like, I mean, I worked for free for the first two years. That's how we managed to survive to this point. But um, the two staff members we have work 70 hour weeks on, on minimum wage. So, um, you know, we're not financially in a position where we can work for free anymore because of our own family situations. So this just gives us um, the ability to sleep at night knowing that we can support our own families to be able to support the community. Suzanne, if I could come back to you uh, for just a moment, because I'd, I'd like to ask uh, our panellists, our guests, for a little bit of advice for people who are watching this. And I'm sure that there are s similar projects up and, up and down the country with varying degrees of success. How important are projects like this in the community? How, how important is it even now and going beyond 2020 into 2021? How important now are connected communities? Gary, connected communities were always important, but we may have forgotten that in part because our communities have become so disconnected. So, and that has happened partly because of COVID. And so COVID has helped us to really, really think about, uh, about disconnection because so many of us have experienced it. I mean, every day now I hear a news story about the impacts of isolation and disconnection, the mental health problems that that's bringing, and just the, the, the grief and loss, which Alice has told us about so effectively. But even before COVID, lots of, lots of disconnection was happening. I think about the post office a lot. Post office doesn't seem very important. You know, you went in the post office, you stood in the queue, but that was the point when you stood in the queue at the post office, you had conversations with people because very often the queue was a bit long. In my experience at the post office, it was always, for, you know, it, my post office was a joyous place. We don't really have that post office anymore. And so I'm just trying to tell a story about where you come together in communities. People used to go to church. A lot of people don't go to church anymore. People used to congregate in the mail room and businesses. Well, they don't need to do that anymore because we get email. So we have a lot of disconnection going on in our lives these days. And that's not good for human beings. 
Human beings are biologically wired to need connection. And so if it isn't happening automatically by the way we live, we need to think more about how we create connection. And it was why I wanted the story of the Haven to be shared, because I hope that it might inspire other communities to think about how they might do this in a way that works in their community. We've had some in the chat here. So I can see in Stranraer, there's a community cafe. But Julia has just told us about how the money for making these things work is challenging. But the Haven started from a, a vision and Julia didn't know how it was gonna work and Jen didn't know it was there and she wandered in because there was an event. But that inspires other people to think about how they bring more connection to their community. That is what we need. And I hope that COVID will help to really inspire us to do that in a way that might not have happened before we all lived through the discomfort of the last year. Jen, uh, Alice, if I could come to you, uh, and, and Jen, um, can I uh, wish you all the best, because I know you've signed up and you've been inspired to take on a university course in psychology uh, as part of all this experience. I have. Um, I think it's, it's a lot of it down to Suzanne and her inspiration and the whole Tigers and Teddies series. Um, I watched the, the book launch partly because Alice had done her teddy for it and because I was really interested. And then I've attended almost all of the, the other episodes in, in both series. It's quite strange to be on the other side of the camera this time. Um, and I just wanted to know more. I was so interested, very curious. Um, I've been doing lots and lots of mindfulness during um, lockdown as well and thinking, what I want to know more. I want to do more. I had um, two. I work part time, so I've got two days off during the week, and I thought, I want. What can I do with that time? So, starting a psychology course, um, and the first year of it is focusing on child psychology and childhood studies, is just amazing. Um, I've just submitted my first assignment, so I'm just waiting to find out how I got on with that. Um, but it's just. It's fascinating and it's thanks to everybody um, at, that's been involved in Tigers and Teddies that have been inspired enough to take this, this next move and this next step. I'm going to leave the last word to Alice in just a moment, but I want to come to Julia, if I may, before we, we move on and just have a look at the series of uh, Tigers and uh, uh, Teddies. Uh, Julia, a, a, a bit of advice bit of inspiration for somebody who's watching this and going do you know what we can do that we should be doing it we are going to do it what bit of advice would you give them mm -hmm. so I've spent a bit of time reflecting on this and I don't think it's the sort of advice you get from a google search um, I think the first thing is to really think about what it is that you need from your community that your community is not offering you what do you need to feel supported in the community because um, it has to start within yourself and then the intention is really pure and if you're feeling that way then there's a high probability that there's a lot of other people in your community feeling that way and then you need to spend some time really listening to your community and um, so you understand the rhythms and so you can respond to that need in a way that suits your community i think a lot of things are too cookie cuttered you know, I don't know if the Haven could work in any other community because it's bespoke to the Haven in Stonehaven. Um, and then it's really important to be brave enough to do things differently. And that takes a lot of courage. And it's really hard to walk a path which says, no, we're not going in this direction. Even if that means that all the experts and all the societal systems in your community say that there's a, no, we do things this way. It's really hard to give another version of that story. And then I think lastly, the other important part is that a lot of people might have the same vision as you, but you might have a different way of working to get there. So work, make sure you really align your energy and your vision with people who have a similar way of getting there as you. And Alice, you have uh, the final word on this, if I may. Alice, can you tell people listening and watching this today why they should love their teddies? Well, 
like if sometimes you feel sad like you might give your teddy a big hug and you might feel better after that like your teddy should be special to you and that's why i wanted you to have the last word um, I'm going to come back to you all in just a moment, but Suzanne, let's reflect on the past uh, two series. Core blimey, core blimey, uh, Gav. Um, let's have a look at some of the numbers, shall we, of what's what's been achieved since you sat down and went, do you know what? It'd be great to have a book launch. <laughs> oh, yeah, a one-off book launch. Fantastic. Saturday morning, no problem at all. Um, should we go through them all? Should we go through all the figures? Tell folks. Okay, so in total, so far, to date, we've had 12 episodes. We've had 33 guests who've been fantastic, and we thank them all. We've had uh, 30 youngsters of all ages uh, who've either sent in drawings or have been part of some wonderful videos that they've contributed to, which is terrific. Uh, 2,300 registrations. So that's when people sign up, as we know. Um, uh, but life, you know, happens on a Saturday morning and not everybody can attend. But out of that, we had 1,300 attendees. Um, that's not including all today's, by the way. So these are, as of uh, yesterday, if you like, 6,400 video viewings, but in total, 7,700 total engagements in this series. Uh, and it's all been, we've had wonderful experts, we've had wonderful guests, uh, and, you know, for me, we were talking about it, weren't we, before, but how do, how do you, before we wrap up, how, how do you feel about what's been achieved? You know, as we've talked about connected communities this morning, I'm struck again, we have managed somehow to create connection through this series. In a time of disconnection there was no vision for it we just did actually what julia talked about we really responded to the energy and that seems to have created connection for people lots of people have said to me that that, a, that this saturday morning broadcast helped to get them through lockdown and all we were doing was telling stories and yet i think those stories are the most powerful ways that we can help people to bring the science to life, which is the point of Connect a Baby, to bring the science of connection to life, and to inspire people to step into the kind of curiosity and courage that Julia and Jen's and Alice's story represents. We could not have done this without all the people who kept coming back. I mean, we've got a regular set of, you know, attendee fans, um, but who then carry that story out. I have been overwhelmed by the amount of support. And for all that I look um, cheery and happy here, there are some days that are really hard. There are some days I wasn't sure it was a good idea to go on with us. So all of you out there, I'm still doing this because you said you wanted it. So for me, this really is a community of people making this happen together. And I'm really grateful to all of you. And we're grateful to you. Um, I believe our producer, Brett, has put a film together for us to celebrate. So I think we would all love to see that now, if, if that's possible. So one of the things that has happened is that, is that we can't see all of you out there because of the format we chose to do this in. But we know you're out there and you've been tweeting lots of photographs of yourself and your teddies. And so we wanted to help to bring you into the room. So this is the video that Brett has put together of lots of the images that you have sent in, which helps to bring all of you into the room too and look back over 12 episodes of Tigers and Tigers. Thank you.
do you know what Suzanne watching that was just brought so many memories back in such a short space of time in terms of the people that we've spoken to uh, and the stories that we've heard and some of that you, you don't forget them but wow you know and, and how impactful that was well done Brett that was superb my friend really good to give people a sense Brett was working on that film till midnight last night trying to capture as many of the photos as we've been sent. So it gives a sense of the kind of energy that you talked about, Julia, Jen, Alice, about what it takes to make a community. And this whole thing has happened because of people's energy and um, generosity and lovely surprises. So as we really move toward the end, we have one more wee surprise, Gary. I believe we have a package there. Yeah, this is this is this is intriguing. This arrived yesterday, and I was under strict instructions not to open it when the postie uh, arrived. So uh, I believe I need to open this now. And and there is a there is a wee story behind this. I think as I because it's very well wrapped. So bear with me. Julian, would you like to take over at this point? Yes. Well, we only thought it would be appropriate that you had a knitted bow tie to add to your collection. Oh my goodness. Hello, Gary. We wanted to include you in our knitted community and show gratitude in what you do. Love the Haven. Oh my goodness. Thank you ever so. I don't even want, that's beautiful. I don't even want to break that open i'm intrigued hang on i know i don't want to be running over time here but this is this gives people a sense of the spontaneity that helps to knit communities of kindness together that is beautiful thank you so much thank you so much i love that and my favorite colors my favorite colors all those numbers you gave a minute ago we knew what it was we knew what it was did you know what it was? Well, thank you very much. I love it. So I actually had 12 bow ties and two gifts. I've now got 13 bow ties and three gifts. Thank you so much. I love it. I absolutely love it. And this will be the first one that I wear in our new series next year, I promise. So that means, Suzanne, we definitely need to do a new series in 2021. So there's no going back. Um, we've got to say a massive thank you to our guests, Jen, Alice, uh, and Julia, you've been fantastic. To the team who make this happen time after time after time after time. So Caitlin that does all the wonderful social media, to uh, our uh, producer, uh, Brett, who uh, makes this all happen technically and does a ton of work behind the scenes. Uh, and, to, and to all the crew, but all to our, to, you know, to our guests, and also to the audience as well, because, you know, without you wanting this, as Suzanne said, we wouldn't be here on a Saturday morning. So thank you so much. And I think, Suzanne, it's just down to you to say the, uh, the final words of the season. Thank you all for being with us. And can I be one of the very first to wish you all a very happy holiday. And it looks like we will see you in the new year with more Teddy and Tiger energy. Let's see you, Teddies, before we go. Okay, Daddy. we'll see you next season. Have stay Daddy. safe. I'm gonna get all of my teddies. <laughs> get all your teddies, Alice. Get all your teddies. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Did that was great. Good. Yeah. Very good. Did you enjoy we that? Did it. Alice, you, you were a star. You were an absolute star. Alice, I thought it was great. What did you, how did you think it was? <laughs> yeah? Tell me why, tell us why. I can't explain in words. I just, I just thought that it was two thumbs up. Two thumbs up. That's good. <laughs> right, where you want to? I also want to go and watch the TV now. <laughs> oh, bye, it's ready to get something. Guys, what did you think? That was just fantastic. <laughs> Julia? 
Yeah, I just I just love doing what I love with people who also love doing it. <laughs> Do you know what what you said was really wise, Julia? You said find people who who want to do it in the spirit that you want to do it. Mm -hmm. you, are, you are absolutely so right. Uh, the the flow, um, you, you know, the way that you are so both relaxed. Uh, Alice is a, a gem. I mean, <laughs> and that's why I wanted the last word to come from Alice because I knew she would just bang. She would just deliver that. And she did it with that, with, you know, no agenda, that childhood innocence and just said everything that as adults and as professionals, we, we say in very long winded ways. And she just was very succinct and she was brilliant. Uh, so I, I just love it. And I love this. <laughs> oh my God. I love this. Uh, but you were both brilliant. And you know what the story is massively inspiring. And I do believe that it will, the, the pickup will come on, 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 on the post broadcast or when it goes out because everybody should share it. I mean, this should go obviously on your social networks, but you know, the, the community of Stonehaven should be sharing this out, you know, so whether you've got, you know, a Stonehaven Facebook page or whatever you've got, but people should be really proud in Stonehaven of what's going on there. But to involve Alice as well, I mean, she's she's quite a she's quite a special character and um i know i'm i'm completely biased because i'm her mum but um when you said the email last night with the you know this is what we're going to be talking about and this is the order and i went through it with her and i said did you want to practice any of it she said no no i don't really want to and i didn't i didn't push it because i know that if she was to practice it, it would then come out to rehearsed and it wouldn't come from the heart. And she's really, really good at being really, really insightful and just getting it. Um, and the things that, you know, all the things that she was speaking about are all the things that I've spoken to her about during, you know, during lockdown. And I try to use, you know, terms like self-regulation and name it to tame it and things like that. And I feel that if she can get that at the age of seven, then wow, she's in so much better position than we all are, you know, by the time she gets to our age, then that'd be amazing. Jen, every child needs someone who is biased in their favor. So don't ever apologize for that. That's what we'll see her through the hard times is that her mom was biased. So there's something about being able to own and celebrate that, even though our culture sometimes wants us to under, undermine it. I'm delighted that you are biased. It will serve Alice. That's why I love having Alice. And I think it was such a divine intervention to have Alice with us because that's where I get all my wisdom from is I just listen to the kids, you know, because I love what you said about Alice not having an agenda. But I would... I would like to have it recorded that you are coming to our fourth Haven Wellbeing Festival. And I am paying for my own train. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Have a great holiday. I'll be in touch after, you know, before, long before, but for now, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure thank to you, meet you. Thank you, Jed, for coming. It thank was so you. nice to meet you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.